So um, we're just going to kind of run through the, the department. I'll probably I'll start out and introduce the, uh, several elements of the department, and then when we get to the residency itself, I'll turn it over to Dr. Osmond and Dr. Dunn uh, so they can review uh, uh, the pro the program itself, and then at the end. I'll ask uh, Dr. Dacey to make a few comments about the department and its trajectory and history. And then we probably can open it up to uh, questions that any of you may have. So this is our hospital. It's right next to a really nice park that we had already talked about, Kayla talked about earlier. Um, that's larger than Central Park actually. And it's, it houses a zoo, a zoo and art museum and uh, restaurants and a lot of different things to do. Uh, and it's right uh, to the west of our hospital, which you see pictured there. Um, the medical school is very good, uh, top four medical school in NIH funding for years and years. Uh, we have amazing comprehensive research uh, facilities, especially in the area of neuroscience. We have the largest medical student, uh, medical scientist training program in the country, and it's actually been approved to be expanded over the next several years by the Dean and School of Medicine. Uh, we have two main uh, hospitals that we, uh, that we uh, work out of, uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital, which is almost 1400 beds level one trauma center, uh, consistently highly ranked in the US News and World Report. And in, in 2020, uh, 10 different specialties uh, were ranked in, uh, 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 nationally uh, uh, at our uh, hospital. So there's a kind of a breadth and depth of expertise uh, at Barnes Jewish Hospital. That's the adult hospital. And St. Louis Children's is right next door, uh, connected by bridges. Um, it's almost 400 beds, level one trauma center, uh, also, multiple specialties nationally ranked, including neurology and neurosurgery, ranked number seven. And it's recently gone, uh, undergone an expansion. I'll talk about that uh, in just a bit. Those are our two main bed platforms and where the vast majority of the work that we do uh, is located. Um, and uh, I think it's important for you to know that because um, almost all of your time would be at those two hospitals. And the nice thing that we think is it's very geographically uh, uh, localized. Uh, so we see our pediatric neurosurgical colleagues and they see uh, the adult neurosurgical colleagues all the time uh, because we're so close to each other. And I also think it makes it very efficient to be a resident because you're not driving around uh, the city uh, wasting a lot of time uh, to and fro each and, uh, you know, each and day, every day. Um, so that geographic localization, I think, really uh, is, is a, a boon for our, our program. Um, part of our medical center, right, you know, and connected to in, in, in the entire campus is the Siteman Cancer Center, which is an NCI uh, a comprehensive cancer center. It just went through a, a recertification in 2020 and got the highest uh, ranking called Exceptional uh, with an, a, really a sterling report from the National uh, Cancer Institute. And it also had a recent expansion called the Parkview Tower, which I'll talk about here in a bit as well. Um, you know, it's not a healthy uh, uh, campus unless it's expanding. And that's something that a lot of people will talk about. And, and we have been uh, uh, very much expanding in recent years. This is the Parkview Tower, which opened up in 2018. It expanded the Siteman Cancer Center, expanded women and infants, and expanded diagnostics. Um, also coming, not open yet, but will be coming probably in the third or fourth quarter of this year is a new integrated spine floor. It's not in the Parkview Tower, it's in our main uh, 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 hospital, uh, but we're gonna combine neurosurgery and orthopedic uh, uh, spine services into one floor, which is going to uh, really kind of streamline and, and improve uh, uh, the care of spine patients after surgery. And then there's a new inpatient bed tower that uh, is gonna be uh, constructed in 2024. Um, it's going to allow, neurosurgery and neuro neurology are not going into that new tower. But as that new tower goes up, that's going to allow for expansion uh, of neurosurgery as things like cardiovascular go to the new tower. And so we're really looking forward to that to expand our, blood, uh, our bed platform and everything's on track despite the pandemic uh, uh, for that to open in 2024. So that's very important for our future. Children's Hospital uh, was also expanded in 2018. There's a picture of that new building. It expanded the NICU, it expanded uh, the number of private inpatient beds and also expanded outpatient clinics. So that has allowed neurosurgery and other services at Children's to continue to expand in recent years. Uh, uh, now I said that uh, the vast majority of our care is at Barnes Hospital and St. Louis Children's, but that is changing. Uh, we are uh, bringing WashU uh, neurosurgery uh, into the community. Um, and that includes the West County Hospital, which you see pictured down there to the right, which uh, is a brand new hospital uh, opened in 2020. Um, and uh, a, a fair amount of our uh, uh, kind of elective uh, small, uh, short stay spine surgery and peripheral nerve surgery is done at that hospital. 
And we do occasionally have residents uh, uh, rotating there for short periods of time. It's not a dedicated uh, 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 place for the residents, uh, but they do spend some time at, at that hospital. It's about a 15 minute drive west of the main campus. Um, there are several other sites that we are bringing WashU neurosurgery to in our community. Uh, ultimately, it will be four additional uh, community hospitals, but none of those hospitals do we plan to bring residents. Um, and a lot of those hospitals will be general neurosurgery that meant to grow and capture market share, but also direct tertiary and quaternary referrals to the main campus. So although you won't be going to those uh, hospitals, I think it's gonna draw patients to the main hospital where you will be in training. Uh, very exciting to us is this expansion of the research uh, facilities at our institution. There's a new research building going up called the Neuroscience Research Building. There's a uh, schematic of that building right now. Uh, there's a big hole in the ground and there's a, uh, 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 kind of the, the scaffolding is being put up right now. Ultimately, um, it, it'll be a $620 million state-of-the-art uh, research building uh, that will ha house uh, over 140 new investigators or, or, or 140 investigators in their laboratories. Um, and this, importantly to us, to neurosurgery, is where the Brain Tumor Center, uh, which was established uh, in 2020, Albert Kim was established as the director in 2021, the research arm of the Brain Tumor Center will be housed on the sixth floor of this building to, to provide co-localization and synergy across uh, 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 over 10 labs uh, uh, that are, uh, from different departments that are currently doing brain tumor research, but in uh, uh, several different locations across uh, uh, the campus. It'll be all centralized in this new research building, which we're really, really excited about. Uh, the Brain Tumor Center was established in 2020 and Dr. Kim, our director was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, appointed in March of 2021, this is a news release from the School of Medicine announcing that. This is a huge uh, 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 endeavor for us, and it is multi-departmental across five different departments, aligned with the School of Medicine, Seitman Cancer Center, Barnes Jewish Hospital, and St. Louis Children's Hospital. And Dr. Kim has a very important director role, and Dr. Dunn, who's on the line, is a co-director uh, of the, of the uh, Brain Tumor Center, and he may have some comments about this. It's, it's, it's both a clinical uh, expansion uh, as well as a basic research expansion. And they really feed on each other in terms of driving clinical trials that drive clinical volume and clinical volume that helps us enroll in innovative clinical trials. Uh, the department administrative offices will be expanding uh, and this we will go live with this in July of 2022, so about a year from now. Uh, this building is already built. It's called the MCC building uh, and neurosurgery will be on the uh, south east uh, corner uh, of the uh, eighth floor of this building, right where you see the, the sign neurosurgery. Uh, we already have uh, uh, the architectural drawings for that, and uh, and um, uh, they are uh, it's out for bid now. And, and my understanding, the work will start within the next few months. Again, for opening in July of 2022. Um, this is a, a kind of a schematic of our healthcare system. Our main our main adult hospital is the Barnes Jewish Hospital (BJH). The main children's hospital is uh, St. Louis Children's Hospital, or SLCH. Our main outpatient clinic where we all see patients is called the CAM, Center for Advanced Medicine. There's a new cancer uh, building that's gonna be constructed and opened in 2023, uh, and I, I'm just calling it the new cancer clinic. I, I don't think it has an official name, but that's where the building's gonna be located. The yellow lines are all these bridges that connect all these things. So all of these things are easily uh, uh, transferable or, or, or you, you can transport yourself, you know, walk to each of these places through bridges, safe, enclosed, you know, not worried about the elements. Um, and then what I have pictured to the right is the neuroscience research building. That's the building I was talking about where the brain tumor center will be going. It too will be connected uh, by an enclosed bridge. Um, and then where you see the heart and neurosurgery, that's the C MCC building where our administrative offices are going to be. And what I love about this is that, you know, it's really at the heart uh, between the clinical enterprise to the left and the research enterprise at the right. And we're really at the end our, our administrative offices, our heart is gonna be uh, in the, uh, at the interface between the clinical and, and research arms. So I really think we're set up for doing great, great things in the future, both from a clinical perspective, as well as a research perspective. Here's the eighth floor of that MCC building. Um, we, we don't get the whole eighth floor, I'd like it, but we're not gonna get the whole eighth floor, but this is the portion that's gonna be ours. And this includes uh, 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 25 faculty offices. All uh, uh, the vast majority of those uh, are, are south facing or east facing with windows. Uh, we have a clinical trials unit 
uh, for, from our, for, for six different individuals who will help support our clinical trials efforts. We're going to have a, 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 an area for uh, three or four people who will be helping uh, uh, with our grant administration for our research enterprise. We have another suite for academic marketing, and this will be for people like medical editors, uh, illustrators, uh, and, uh, and, and, and people uh, and, and biostatisticians, people like that. Uh, to the left uh, will be a uh, almost 70 uh, seat uh, uh, auditorium lecture hall, uh, which will be a really a central part of all of our uh, uh, academics and our, and our conferences and things. And then in here is uh, the resident room. And I have a blow up of that. Well, this is a blow up of that space now. Again, the lecture hall, these four, three different suites for clinical trials, grants, and academic marketing. A, uh, a large resident room, which I'll give a blow up of that in just a little bit, uh, as well as an additional conference room and then all the faculty offices. Here's the resident room, which you may be most interested in. Um, so this is gonna be uh, south facing. These are all uh, uh, floor to ceiling windows. And then the wall, the wall itself, south facing wall is also uh, floor to ceiling windows. So there's gonna be a lot of natural light coming in. The main area is about 800 uh, square feet. And then there's a locker, locker area here, and then two changing rooms. Uh, so people can change in the scrubs and things. This is going to be a great, great addition. Um, we have a small resident room now. It's been, you know, fairly functional, but this is going to be a dramatic expansion of this. And uh, all the bells and whistles are being put into this, including uh, kind of a, a, a couches and seating, something that look something along these lines, um, as well as uh, bench spaces and seating arrangements, something that'll look a little bit like that uh, for workspaces here. So we're really excited about that. The residents deserve it. They're really a, a central part of what we do and uh, having a very nice space like this with where, where all the faculty and all the staff are, are located is gonna be a great, great addition. And that's coming in one year. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just mention, we have a tremendous group of residents. You, you can see them pictured here, PGY1, our, our new uh, recruit class down to the right, PGY2 uh, here and on all the way up. We have three amazing chief residents. They just started a week or so ago. Um, uh, Chris Dibble is going to be doing a, a spine fellowship at UVA. Uh, uh, Jacob's going to be doing a spine fellowship uh, in Cleveland Clinic and then uh, uh, and, and looking uh, for academic positions after Chris will as well. Bhavik Patel is going to be doing a skull base fellowship and then he's going to be doing uh, the traveling um, uh, Van Wegenen fellowship uh, a year later. Uh, and uh, so he's got two more years of fellowship training, including this very prestigious Van Wegenen fellowship that he'll be doing and then coming back to be a brain tumor surgeon scientist. So a great group of, uh, of, of residents, a, a, you know, very strong on culture and cohesiveness, uh, very diverse and, uh, and, and, and group that we're really proud of. Um, we currently have 15 adult faculty and four pediatric neurosurgeons. Uh, we are currently in a recruitment mode uh, for a fifth pediatric neurosurgeon. Dr. Matt Smith is a pediatric neurosurgeon that is just leaving us to become a division chief at Johns Hopkins uh, uh, um, all Children's Hospital in Tampa. So he's taking a leadership position and we're recruiting a new pediatric epilepsy surgeon uh, to replace him. In addition to these 15 adult neurosurgeons, we have two uh, spine faculty that we've already recruited and signed that will be coming in a year and I'll, I'll introduce them in a bit. In addition, we have a, a rapidly growing group of uh, PhD uh, uh, independent investigators. Um, uh, uh, many of these are in areas like brain tumors and neurotechnology. Um, and uh, we have several uh, uh, ongoing recruits uh, 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 into this PhD scientist uh, arena here. So um, it, it's a growing uh, group. And like I said, we have 25 offices uh, for the adult neurosurgeons plus the five offices for pediatric neurosurgery. So we have very robust growth goals, uh, growth goals over the next five to 10 years. Um, here's our current faculty. Uh, I think it's a very dynamic uh, uh, group of faculty and diverse. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what I'll just point out here is uh, over the past two years, uh, uh, four clinicians, as you see listed here, and three scientists, as you see listed here, have been recruited uh, into the department. So it's a growing group of, uh, of scientists and uh, surgeons that I'm really proud of. In terms of the clinical space, uh, on, on the barn side, the adult side, we have six dedicated ORs. Uh, two of which uh, have an IMRI uh, uh, system, uh, the uh, IMRI the, uh, system. Uh, that's uh, one MRI services uh, two ORs. So we have availability of uh, IMRI in two ORs on the adult side. We have two dedicated pediatric neurosurgery ORs, and we have a new laser OR suite with an with a uh, IMRI in it. Uh, I'm sorry, with an MRI uh, 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 in it, 
as well as a new hybrid OR suite that are uh, being planned uh, for opening in 2024. So there'll be an expansion here. We currently do about 3,400 adult cases and almost 1,000 uh, pediatric cases a year in a, in a very strong gamma knife program. So very robust clinical program uh, across all subspecialties, which I'll introduce here in a second. Our vascular program uh, is uh, primarily uh, myself and Dr. Osman, uh, who's on the line, as well as our new recruit, Dr. Anant Valemana, uh, who uh, we've known, I've known very, very, uh, for quite a long, long time. Uh, Anant was a postdoc in my lab. He trained at All India Institute for medical school, was in my lab for three years, and then completed our residency, did a fellowship in Seattle for open vascular, and then an endovascular fellowship with Dr. Osman here at Wash U. He'll be starting August 1st, and we'll round out our vascular program. Skull-based program uh, is very uh, 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 robust uh, uh, with uh, both uh, open uh, skull-based, minimally evasive approaches and, and, and a very uh, significant expanded endoscopic approach. You see the numbers here in terms of uh, procedures. Dr. Shacoin, Dr. Kim, and myself uh, do most of the skull base, and Dr. Osman does as well, as he mentioned earlier. Um, so a very, uh, 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 a, a very strong skull-based program. We actually, I don't have it in the slide deck, but we have very close relationships with neurotology. Dr. Buckman, the chair there, is a neurotologist, and with, his, with him and his recruits, really have expanded our acoustic program, uh, both from a clinical volume, but also from an innovation perspective. Um, um, and we have great relationships with uh, head and neck, uh, with neuro-ophthalmology, uh, and, uh, and others. So uh, really a, a really strong skull-based program. The Brain Tumor Center is a huge uh, push for us. I think we've had an amazing uh, growth of this program over the past 10 years and, and uh, under Dr. Dacey's leadership. And we're, we're taking that foundation and we wanna take it to another couple of levels uh, uh, higher. We have uh, uh, almost $20 million ultimately are gonna be going into this Brain Tumor Center from an academic recruitment perspective, infrastructure, as well as partnership uh, from the hospital to build out the Brain Tumor uh, Bank, uh, a clinical trials program, a uh, number of patient uh, brain tumor uh, navigators, a brain tumor program manager and a marketing pro uh, program. So this is a major effort, again, led by Dr. Kim and co-directed by Dr. Dunn, Dr. Shacoin, Dr. Luthar, and Dr. Dowling also do a lot of our brain tumors among some others. Epilepsy program uh, is very uh, robust, both on the pediatric uh, and on the adult side. Uh, Dr. Willie is a new recruit as of about a year ago. We trained him. He was on staff at Emory, uh, and then we recruited him back. Uh, he's an R01 funded, uh, a very innovative uh, 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 epilepsy and functional neurosurgeon, and he uh, is leading our clinical epilepsy program. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're uh, recruiting a, a new pediatric epilepsy surgeon to replace Dr. Uh, Smith uh, here. And so that'll be coming online here in the next few months. And Dr. Luthard also is very active in our epilepsy program. We have a very strong stereotactic and, and deep brain stimulation program, also led by Dr. Willie. Dr. Dowling does a lot of uh, our uh, gamma knife. He's actually our gamma knife director, as well as a lot of the deep brain stimulation along with uh, Dr. Willie. And Dr. Luthart uh, does a lot of radio surgery and a laser program, which I'll mention here in a moment. The laser program, we were one of the first in the country to begin doing laser therapy, Dr. Luthart. And then with the addition of Dr. Kim and Dr. Willie, we have a very strong uh, uh, and nationally, internationally recognized uh, uh, laser ablation therapy program for, for not only tumors, but also beginning for other areas like epilepsy and some cameras malformations and things of that nature. As I mentioned earlier, we have a brain laser center uh, 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 program uh, that we are partnering with the hospital to build out in 2024. So it's a it really uh, a internationally recognized laser program. A very strong pain program. Dr. Dowling uh, uh, really does the vast majority of this. Um, he, he does something along the lines of 90 to 100 uh, microvascular decompression uh, procedures for trigeminal neuralgia and hemifacial spasm and a smattering of, and of other uh, uh, procedures for uh, pain. And, uh, and, and it's a very uh, a strong program. And, and he's an excellent technical surgeon and knows more about trigeminal neuralgia and hemifacial spasm than, than you know, most. Our spine program is uh, rapidly expanding. Um, we currently have five spine surgeons led by Dr. Ray, who's our division chief. Uh, Dr. Molina and Dr. Penny Cook were new recruits a, a year ago. They're about a year into their practice. Uh, Dr. Molina trained at Hopkins uh, um, and uh, as a real surgical innovator, especially in the area of augmented reality. He uh, 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 is an inventor of uh, something called X-Vision that he brought to uh, Wash U and, and is a, a already a world leader in this new technology. Dr. Pennycook trained at Cornell and UCSF and joined us about a year ago. 
and uh, it was a wonderful addition, focusing in on MIS uh, 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 type of, uh, of surgery. And it's been a joy for him to join the program, along with Dr. Santiago, who's been here for quite a long time, uh, and, and, doc, and Dr. Dorward. And you can see the kind of volume that we're doing with our spine program. We do have a spine fellowship, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and that has been a wonderful uh, uh, kind of academic uh, and surgical uh, addition to our spine program. And, uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we have two new recruits. Here they are. Dan Hafez uh, trained with us here, just finished his chief residency. We'll go do his um, fellowship at Pittsburgh, and then um, he will be coming back and focusing his efforts at uh, uh, minimally invasive spine surgery, and especially, I spelled that wrong, but especially uh, endoscopy, uh, endos endoscopic approaches uh, uh, for the treatment of spine uh, uh, conditions. And then Nitin Agarwal is a uh, chief resident, just finished up at Pittsburgh. We'll be doing a fellowship at UCSF, and we'll be focusing on building out our uh, spine deformity program, as well as neurotrauma. Uh, and uh, so we can't wait uh, for them to get here and they'll be here in July of 2022. Peripheral nerve, nerve program is led by Dr. Ray. He's internationally recognized for his work in peripheral nerve uh, surgery. Uh, he's a, a, a DOD funded, two DOD grants, looking at uh, uh, the, the, uh, the use of nerve transfers for uh, cervical spinal cord injury and, um, and, and has a very uh, a robust pr practice. And, uh, and something that uh, has really been a great addition as he's built this up over the past uh, eight, eight or nine years. And finally, the pediatric program, which you know really is one of the crown jewels uh, of our uh, of our um, uh, of our department. Uh, you know, I think it's the best pediatric program in the country. We have four uh, pediatric uh, spine surgeon or pediatric surgeons. Uh, Dr. Park was the chief of uh, pediatrics for uh, I think about twenty years or so. Dr. Lemberg took that over about three or four years ago. Dr. Straley is R01-funded, uh, uh, outstanding technical uh, clinical neurosurgeon who does her research in areas of uh, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. And Dr. McAvoy was the most recent recruit a couple of years ago, uh, who is a great uh, clinician, educator. The residents love him, uh, the anatomy uh, uh, that he teaches, and his oversight in the operating room. And he's building out our neuromodulation uh, program for, on the pediatric side. Uh, almost 1,000 procedures. And the, the pediatric uh, uh, group likes to point out that the number of shunts is far less uh, than, um, and then what is uh, average for the, for the, uh, across the nation. And then finally, uh, I'll just run through quickly the labs. Uh, uh, you'll see that there are eight uh, uh, R01 funded neurosurgeon labs now. That's neurosurgeon labs. That's the most in the country by, I think by one or two. Um, and then we also have uh, several uh, PhD uh, uh, NIH funded labs. So uh, Dr. Bruner is a PhD scientist who looks at uh, uh, cortical electrophysiology and how it governs human behavior. Uh, uh, Dr. Dunn has a cancer immunogenomics uh, laboratory uh, looking at uh, uh, capitalizing on the uh, uh, immune uh, uh, response and, and, and immune therapies uh, for uh, better treatment of glioblastoma. Dr. Holler is a geneticist uh, who is applying that background to a variety of, uh, of neurosurgical conditions, including especially Chiari and syringomyelia, uh, has an R21. Uh, Dr. Kim has two R01s looking at various drivers of, uh, brain, uh, of uh, glioblastoma stem cells and invasiveness and, and novel therapies. Dr. Luthard is internationally recognized uh, for his uh, neurotechnology and neuroinnovation, but he also runs a brain computer interface uh, laboratory that's NIH R01 funded, um, uh, looking at uh, using that platform for brain computer interface. I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Dr. Limbrick um, um, looks at CSF markers of neurological disease, especially hydrocephalus and neurodegeneration and runs a very large consortium for Chiari and syringomyelia, looking at genetics and imaging and clinical uh, research. Uh, he's NIH and PCORI funded. And in fact, his most recent R01 grant got a one percentile, which is really rare to get that type of score. Uh, so he, he is top tier. Dr. Petty was a recruit, PhD recruit last year um, and is a computational geneticist, uh, focusing her efforts on glioblastoma, works very closely with Dr. Kim, Dr. Dunn and others. And uh, I, I'm sure she'll be NIH funded very soon. Dr. Ray is uh, R01 funded and, and, and DOD and DARPA funded for a variety of things related to uh, nerve regeneration and neuroprosthetics. Finally, Dr. Straley, uh, uh, I mentioned before, has an R01. Uh, actually, she was the first, the quickest to get an R01 in, in the history of our department. Three years in, she got her R01 looking at post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Dr. Willie was recruited from, e, uh, from Emory. He's R01 funded, uh, looking at uh, uh, electrophysiology uh, in terms of circuits governing memory and sleep. Dr. Yano is R01 funded uh, for the epigenetics of neurodegenerative diseases and brain tumors. 
And I have an R01 funded lab looking at amyloid angiopathy and its an impact on dementia, as well as brain injury, delayed cerebral ischemia after subarachnoid hemorrhage. So a lot of uh, uh, research, the vast majority of it NIH funded. So a lot of labs to consider and certainly a lot of uh, mentors to help you guide your academic careers. And lastly, I'll just mention the Division of Neurotechnology. We created this two years ago, kind of built on something called the Center for Innovation in Neuroscience and Technology that Dr. Luthart started with Dr. Dacey about 15 years ago. And we wanted to build that out. And, uh, and uh, I named uh, Eric the chief of that division. And he is recruiting people like Peter Bruner and Mayo Sienes, who are PhD scientists, uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 helping mentor and, and grow the careers, academic careers of Dr. Molina, Dr. Willie, and others. And I'll just mention this, that I mean, he has I mean, have over a thousand patents. Uh, he has about eight or nine startups. I mean, he is the real deal, absolute international leader in this, including this that just came out April 27th, 2021. So literally, you know, a couple of months ago where uh, the first brain computer interface uh, uh, device has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of chronic stroke. Uh, and that's just an example uh, of the type of uh, work that Dr. Luthard is doing and we're all following his lead and something that uh, I think uh, differentiates us from a lot of programs around the country. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dunn and Dr. Osmond so they can talk about the residency. I'll, I'll run the slides and just let me know to move the slides yeah, forward. Per perfect, Greg, thanks. I was just about to ask that. So thanks, that was a great, uh, great overview of the department. And uh, Dr. Osborne and I are, uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, Greg, um, uh, are the program director and I'm the program director, Dr. Osmond, associate pro program director with Lee. Uh, we run the residency, um, it really is a co-directorship, and then Kayla, uh, who's uh, on the Zoom here as well, uh, is a key part of our, uh, our uh, residency uh, program team, and uh, we are, uh, you know, we meet very frequently and, and uh, are always thinking about ways to improve this program. Uh, next slide, please. So our, just a, a couple of the uh, just logistics of our program, uh, you know, we have a Great group of residents that uh, that Dr. Ziffel highlighted earlier, and that's what uh, really makes uh, this uh, so much fun and so enjoyable for us. Uh, so we uh, we have uh, three residents per year and uh, in, in a seven year program, so 21 residents. Um, and just how that breaks down is there, there are 12 months of a neurosurgery internship, 24 months of a junior residency, uh, 12 months of a senior residency. Now we also have 18 months of, of, of research time that, that's really but largely very protected. Um, and then six months of an international elective uh, in Ireland, which we'll touch on in a, in a little bit here. And then uh, the final year is the 12 months of the chief residency for total training time of 84 months. Uh, next slide, please. And the reason we, we uh, asterisked uh, the uh, 18 months, by the way, is we, we do have 18 to 24 months, uh, depending on uh, whether or not uh, you are part of our investigated, uh, expanded investigator track, and I'll, we'll touch on that in the next slide. But that research time, be it a year and a half or two years, like I said, it, it is very, very well protected. Um, and, and then uh, residents are productive during that time. Uh, their uh, H index is very high uh, and, and ranked as such for residents who are conducting research. Um, we take their training and their mentorship very seriously. Uh, we have uh, some formal structures like a, a, a quarterly neuroscience research mentorship group or NRMG uh, mechanism where, you know, numerous PIs and leaders from, uh, from our multiple disciplines uh, mentor uh, residents who are either early in the process or writing grants or giving us updates. Um, our residents are uh, very competitive for writing uh, grants during their research time. Uh, we have actually under uh, Dr. Zippel's leadership, we have something called an R25 uh, program, uh, which uh, supports uh, residents doing uh, research and um, our residents very recently have been very successful uh, obtaining funding through that. And also uh, additional, uh, really what I would say are, are extramural uh, grants as well, whether it's uh, through the CNS uh, in a Syringomyelia Fellowship the AANS and REF fellowships, uh, NRSAs, uh, F32s, and also uh, intramural uh, WashU grants as well. Next slide, please. So I mentioned this a couple of times, uh, but uh, just to uh, be a little bit more detail about it, we um, wanted to create ways that we could expand uh, the opportunities for research for uh, usually a single resident 
during uh, each uh, lab time cycle to 24 months from 18 months. And so that goes from January of the PGY four year to December of the PGY six year. Importantly, you don't, that does not come at the expense of your Ireland uh, rotation. So what, what it really does for that particular resident is it just takes uh, some of the other research rotations that we have uh, uh, pre-existing in, um, in the residency structure, and it really just collapses them uh, in, in one contiguous uh, 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 stretch. So uh, we're really just kind of bar borrowing those rotations from other periods and then putting them uh, back to back. Um, and we also reduce your endovascular uh, time uh, and, and you reduce uh, a little bit of your clinical time. Um, but these are that that experience is for, for people who are very serious about uh, being investigators. And uh, well, it's not something that you apply for in the match, but it is something that uh, we ask for a, a formal proposal during uh, late in your PGY2 year. And, uh, you know, we, we, we know that people's plans may change between the end of your PGY2 year and the beginning of your, in the January of your PGY4 year. But uh, this is a, is a uh, reflection of that the uh, applicant is, is thinking very seriously about a project, but more importantly, has assembled a, a mentorship team and a PI uh, that makes that um, whole situation look uh, very feasible and very promising. So we're excited about that. Uh, the, the first president is already uh, in uh, this track. Uh, we have another one starting uh, in six months. So, uh, so this is, I think, gonna be uh, very popular for the, for the right resident. Next slide, please. So uh, we have adult and pediatric locations, and Dr. Zipfel uh, really talked about th those two uh, facets of our department. Uh, on, the, uh, on the adult side, we have three uh, teams that are three chief residents and six junior residents. Uh, we have uh, a, a call structure. So we, we do not have a night float system. We have a, uh, an overnight call system uh, for the PGY two through four uh, residents on the adult side. It's in-house call, which is really uh, uh, shakes out to be a, a Q6 for every sixth uh, night. And then the, the, chief, the chief call that's shared between three chiefs. So that uh, uh, ends up being Q3 uh, home call. Next slide, please. On the pediatric side, uh, there's one pediatric team that, that is composed of two residents and also one pediatric fellow. Uh, you know, the, the pediatric fellowship uh, has been uh, something we've had uh, uh, for, for a very long time, uh, and it has turned out uh, many uh, really well-known uh, and, and illustrious pediatric neurosurgeons. It really is sort of one of our dual fellowships, and that uh, pediatric fellow is a key part of the pediatric uh, team. Uh, and then that, that home call then ends up being about every, uh, you know, two and a half uh, nights or so, and then the weekend coverage, uh, just technically speaking, is split with our fellows. Next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, many opportunities to uh, enhance and enrich your training through meetings and courses. Um, it, you know, here at WashU, we have a, an annual neurosurgery research symposium, which really highlights and, and profiles the, the work that all of our residents are doing, uh, both uh, with clinical and basic uh, research. And we have uh, spine and uh, skull-based uh, surgery courses as well. And I want to highlight this picture uh, that's at, at the bottom here, which is the, is the anatomy lab, uh, which is on the 10th floor of our Macmillan building. Um, this is a, a really very sophisticated uh, cadaver lab, uh, which uh, you know, both allows us to host these types of courses, uh, but really uh, residents can access this in, a, in really in an ad hoc fashion uh, for any kind of surgical enrichment that they want. We have the surgical tools, the scopes, the cameras, you can see the video setups to uh, really uh, you know, go through and, and, and practice the wide range of uh, spine and also uh, cranial uh, approaches. And our residents uh, really take advantage of that. Uh, our faculty uh, has definitely uh, bought in to, uh, to be a faculty at, at the courses that we put on there. So this has been a great uh, development uh, that, that um, the department and, and Dr. Zippel and the ENT folks have also led. So. Uh, this is a, a great thing for surgical education uh, for, for our residents. Um, and then nationally, uh, we, we have a, a, a policy. You can go to a, a number of meetings, uh, you know, throughout, uh, throughout your residency and, and really our residents, um, you know, we, we support that. We want them to, to be a part 
of the National Neurosurgical Conversation. That's the CNS, the AANS, but it, those are sort of the, the, the bigger meetings, but then there, there are lots of other field specific meetings, whether it's the, the tumor section or the vascular section or the spine, peripheral nerve section, uh, particular endovascular uh, meetings, minimally invasive spine meetings, the Society for Neuro-Oncology, you know, our, our, our residents, you know, do go to the, uh, the, the important field specific uh, meetings as well, uh, which not only, you know, helps them think about uh, what their next steps are going to be and what they might want to focus on, but also, you know, uh, allows them to, uh, you know, start really uh, interfacing and intersecting with uh, not only co-residents at these courses, but also key faculty members and key leaders uh, on the national uh, neurosurgery scene. So uh, we are very supportive of that. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the, the last uh, slide as it relates to the, uh, relates to the program. And this, uh, as we've touched on a few times, we have an international uh, rotation uh, set up in, in the Royal Beaumont Hospital in Dublin. And uh, this has really become a rich tradition in our department. And it's also a very long standing one that was established by uh, Dr. Dacey several decades ago. We have a great relationship uh, with the Royal Beaumont uh, neurosurgeons. And what this does uh, is really uh, allows uh, the resident in, in the uh, before the chief time to have uh, what is a, a very significant uh, autonomous surgical experience uh, that is, you know, uh, supervised by uh, the, the Royal Beaumont neurosurgeons. But uh, our residents perform, you know, well over 150 cases as a primary surgeon uh, in that experience. We cover the cost of the travel and the licensure uh, and also some, some other sort of day-to-day -day life uh, aspects of, of being there. Um, uh, this is uh, something that our, our residents really grow from, they, they really enjoy. Um, and um, again, we, we have uh, really, it's become a, a really rich and important tradition in our department and, and one that uh, our residents really look forward to. And uh, I'm, I'm still waiting to, to have that Guinness uh, there. It looks very good. I'd like to, to have one of those in Dublin as a site visit. Um, next slide, please. And uh, our, we're very proud of our graduates. Uh, you know, I think as is a national trend, a lot of our graduates uh, are completing fellowships now. When you look at where they're going, uh, be it for endovascular, functional, uh, pediatric, spine, uh, uh, vascular, and skull base, which are really the main uh, fellowship areas, uh, those fellowships are being completed at really the, uh, really the, the most elite fellowship sites, uh, be it uh, here or elsewhere, as you can see on that list. Um, and our breakdown is that 65% uh, or more uh, stay in academic practices and then 35% uh, uh, are in a, the private practice setting. Next slide, please. And uh, ultimately, this is our last slide. You know, I would just also point out that, uh, you, you know, this is a terrific department with a great culture and St. Louis is a great place to live. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, uh, we have uh, a, a lot of uh, cultural uh, venues, uh, a lot of great places to eat. Uh, I, I included the top picture, which is our new Major League Soccer team starting in 2023. So it's a little bit gratuitous, uh, but uh, uh, there's the St. Louis Blues, the Cardinals, uh, the Fox Theater, uh, and um, just, uh, all of the trappings of, uh, of a city in a place that I think most people would agree is uh, a very easy place to live, uh, but uh, really uh, you can make a home here uh, and pursue all of your uh, interests that are outside neurosurgery. And, and that's, that's important because you know, training is, is seven years and uh, we want you to continue to grow as a, as a person and continue to, to cultivate your interests. And uh, I think you can do all of that here uh, while you uh, get uh, world-class neurosurgical training. So um, I'll leave it there. Um, and uh, Dr. Dacey, I think, uh, has a couple of uh, uh, words to add as well. And then we'd love to uh, spare a little bit of time to, to answer any of the questions you might have. Well, thank you, Gavin. Uh, Greg and Gavin have covered a lot. I'll just briefly add this. I learned long ago that if you want to have a stimulating rewarding long career in neurosurgery uh, and practice in the best academic centers or the most prestigious, prestigious private uh, centers, you have to do two things. One, you need to learn how to be an excellent 
technical neurosurgeon. Uh, and the second thing is you need to do scholarly work so that you can promote your career and be rewarded by the satisfaction that we all get from doing that kind of work. And there is no place better situated to do that than here. Uh, the department, I think, was pretty good when I was running it. It's dramatically better now. It's unbelievable in my judgment because we have technical experts and leading innovators in every single um, discipline and sub-discipline of neurosurgery, ranging from endovascular to of microsurgery for cerebrovascular to uh, all kinds of the best things, laser, interstitial therapy, brain-computer interface. Dr. Ziffel went through it. It's, it's astounding to me. And if you want to be prepared to have that kind of a life as a neurosurgeon, and I believe you do because it's a great life, then come here. And that's, that's, that's what I think. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Dr. Dacey. That was great. Um, Dr. Osmond, you want to add anything? And, or then we can open up for questions. I think this, uh, what strikes me, you know, this being, you know, one of my, I guess, fourth department I've been involved with since I was a medical student is just, um, you know, the quality of the faculty and the residents is, you know, unsurpassed. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, being a part of this program and uh, how it continues to grow every year. Um, and then I think the, the training really makes sense and it's extremely well organized from year one to year seven. And um, I think um, the opportunities that we can give you um, for clinical expertise and then you know, adding in a lot of the research uh, elements to that really prepares you for any um, any career that you uh, want to pursue. I think you know as well, if not better than any other program in the country. So that's that's one thing I've been you know most impressed with my few years here is how well organized the program is and and how logical it is throughout the progression. All right. Well, maybe we'll open up to any questions you might have at this point. Juan Fan? Yeah, oh, go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'm really fascinated by the academic environment in your department. So, and also that's why uh, I came to Duke University for a PhD training in neuro-oncology. Uh, I'm scheduled to do a sub eye talk uh, at Duke Neurosurgery next month. I wonder if there are any other similar opportunity at WashU so that as medical students who are doing research, uh, we could also have an opportunity to share our research with your faculty and also residents so that we can establish connections and also maybe find potential mentors for future residency training. I really wish to submit my best application to your program. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll answer that. I mean, obviously, if you did a sub I here, you know, you'd have an opportunity. All our sub I's, you know, uh, can give a, a research talk. You know, I don't think we have anything formal uh, in terms of a way, you know, virtually how people could give talks in that way. Certainly during the interview process, you know, uh, it's going to be a big area that we're going to ask about and, and, and you may want to talk about. Um, I can tell you, knowing the lay of the land, and maybe Gavin may want to field this, but uh, knowing the lay of the land at what's happening in brain tumors at Duke. Uh, in fact, I was just at a meeting uh, um, three days ago with Peter Fetchy um, and, uh, and, and, and talked with him quite extensively <clears throat> that, you know, that there are going to be a lot of there's going to be some overlap and some, you know, and certainly have some outstanding mentors here uh, within the neurosurgery department and outside of the neurosurgery department that someone who is that kind of background, uh, you know, would, would, you know, do very well here. And, and again, during the interview process, you'll certainly have an opportunity to talk about your, your research. I don't know, Dr. Dunn, if you have other comments about that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think the, the, the most, um, practical way is, is, is to do, do a sub I. Um, and then I think that the, um, and, and both for you and, and for everybody else in the call, I think your, um, you know, the kind of the, the, the breadth of your application and the depth of your application here comes out in the application and the interviews too. So even, even if you don't have a, a formal way to, you know, give a talk outside of a sub I, 
um, you, you know, th there are, are ways to, you know, uh, uh, um, discuss and, and uh, um, you know, almost advertise what you've done, you know, in, in those other settings. So I think what, what you're describing is one, but I think there, there are other ways to certainly that would be embedded and really uh, underlined uh, and emphasized in your application and in your interviews, you know, that's something that uh, would come up to you. Thank you. Are there other questions we can answer? Yes, I had a question. Um, was there a decision made of whether the interviews are gonna be virtual or in person this cycle? And mm -hmm. if they are, if they remain virtual, is there any way that an applicant can stand out during the interview? So tomorrow night, I am, uh, I'm, so I'm the point person for a, a working subgroup of the education committee for the senior society, the, the program director society for neurosurgery on this topic. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dunn has also been involved. I know maybe Dr. Uh, Osmond as well. Um, so this is a hot topic. Um, this is my lay of the land right now. I think it is highly likely that uh, a virtual first interview will be part of the process. I think, I, I, I think that's, I mean, for the, there, there are, the ACGME and people like that are really heading down that road. And there's a lot of good reasons for it. I mean, it's way cheaper. Uh, there's issues about equity. Uh, uh, some people can afford to, you know, go to 20 interviews. Some people cannot. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there are other issues. So I think there's a lot of reasons why the virtual interviews as a first pass makes sense. So I suspect the first pass will be virtual. Um, I, 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 I can get now from that point, from that point forward, then I think it's, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. I can tell you, but I will say, I'll give you my own personal take on this and I'll give you what I think is probably a collective take on some of the people who are involved with this decision-making from the senior society perspective, which is we would like to include some sort of uh, in-person uh, visit somehow. Um, um, but it turns out that's very complex. What we can't do is have everybody uh, uh, go virtual and then everybody also comes in person, you know, uh, you know, it, because in some sort of way where, well, if I don't go visit Wash U, they're not going to think I'm interested. And therefore, you know, I have to go and I have to go to 15 or 20 places in person. Nobody wants that. That's the whole, that's not the design of the whole thing. At the same time, you're going to spend seven years in a place. Uh, and it's very difficult, I think, last year for the candidates to get a feel for our department and our city and where you might live and the culture that's very hard to get a, to, to come across through a, a Zoom format. Um, I think we can evaluate the candidates pretty well, uh, but it's hard for them to get to know us and the community and the, and the it, it's just that in the culture, that, that part's hard. So is there a way that we can cr create an environment where uh, students can come in a select way to some programs that are in their top five or six or something along those lines, but doesn't, somehow dis you know, disadvantage them in case they don't match at the top five or six, you know, in some sort of way. I think there's some ideas. I have my own that I think, you know, I, I think would, you know, work fairly well, but uh, we'll have to see where those go. But my take is the first pass is going to be virtual. I think neurosurgeons is going to work really hard to try to create some sort of, some sort of format where for a select group of, of programs, you can come to do in-person uh, visits, but to do it in a way that doesn't, make you feel like I have to go do that at 15 or 20. Uh, but exactly the formula for that, I think, is going to take some time. I'm, uh, in terms, I've also been asked, how long is it going to take for those recommend, you know, for that recommendation from the senior side to come out? I don't know, but I suspect it's going to need to be done in the next couple of months, by the end of the summer, because that's, we have to get this going in, in terms of, so, so residencies and students can kind of prepare. So that's, that's my take on it right now. But, but uh, I think over the next month or two, decisions will be made. I just wanted to add to that, the, the other part of your question, which is how can you stand out in the virtual uh, format? Um, you know, I, I and, and Dr. Ziffo alluded to this, I, I think that the, the virtual interview format works out very, very well. And uh, I, I don't think that it's, uh, and I think the more people think about it is something that's just like in-person interviews, except for the fact that you're not seeing the institution. So that part, Dr. Ziffel touched on, but it, it, if you just think about it like any other interview, uh, then, and, and make it as kind of normal as possible and going to it thinking that, then, um, th then, you know, 
you are going to make yourself stand out. I don't think there's anything. I, I mean, there are some very practical things like not having crazy backgrounds and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, <laughs> but uh, those are, those are sort of obvious, but, but I, I think it really is just a conversation. And uh, I, I think our experience, uh, I think on the faculty side and our program side with the last year of virtual interviews, uh, I think it worked out great, you know, and, and, and frankly, it does for the applicant, it, it does cut down on it. it you know, if, if you're having to turn down an interview because, you know, you just can't fly out and get to some other place on time, it, it does label you. To, I mean, some people, you know, a medical student who worked in my lab was like, well, I interviewed here in the morning and this other place in the afternoon and, you know, all from, you know, his apartment. Uh, so uh, I, I think, but how to stand out, I think it, it's just, it, it just be, you know, act natural uh, because uh, the, the more you approach it naturally, like it's in person, uh, the, the better you'll do. Thank you so much. I appreciate those answers. Thank you. Michael, you have a, your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, this presentation was phenomenal and answered basically every question that I could have come up with. But um, the one I had was that uh, I've really, you know, the neurotechnology side is just fascinating to me. And it, it, this kind of seems paralleled by no one. Um, uh, I was wondering if there's an opportunity to engage with like the School of Engineering and Computer Science to, um, you know, improve in programming and uh, in terms of techniques and uh, that sort of thing during your education. Because um, that, that's something that uh, definitely would be interested in. Yeah. Ralph, Ralph may have some uh, some comments about this as well, since he was at the beginning of it when when Eric Luther was getting this started. But I'll just make a couple early comments. One is I didn't mention it, but I should have. I mean, this is very very integrated and tied into the engineering campus, which is on the west side of that park. So we're about three miles away, and um, and, uh, and and so I mean you know Dan Moran was a, is a co inventor of that uh, uh, of that dev that that BCI device for stroke. I just mentioned he's a, 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 a professor of engineering. I personally, as a chair, have met with uh, uh, the the dean of engineering and uh, bio and the and the, the uh, department chairs of biomedical engineering, electrical and engineering, and mechanical engineering about how can we further uh, 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 bring our two you know, campuses together uh, in the neurotechnology, because they want to grow it, we want to grow it, and we want to do it together. And I think there's going to be, you know, so, so that's kind of just broadly. Um, so anything that's going on in that division, you know, the, the Mayo Sianas, who I didn't mention a lot, is actually primarily in the uh, biomedical engineering uh, department, and we co-recruited uh, him. Um, so there's lots of cross-pollination, cross-connections there. Uh, and the other thing is uh, they do have these, uh, inno these innovations fellowships uh, where many residents will get uh, uh, teamed up with engineering students uh, over a summer uh, where they kind of have ideas, you know, they'll bring a clinical problem, the engineering will bring some of that kind of background, and they ultimately lead to new ideas, prototypes, and some of the best of ones go on for patents and things of that nature. So uh, there's a lot of interaction between the two. Ralph, do you have other comments about that? Well, just to add that Part of what Dr. Luthart set up was a deliberate um, uh, planned um, monthly uh, innovation session that always involves engineers, always involves um, entrepreneurs, always involves neurosurgeons and neurologists. And so it's the most uh, planned um, innovation thing that I've seen. And, uh, it, and of course, we're hand in glove with the engineers. That's phenomenal. Wow, thank you. Uh, someone else had a hand up for a bit. Um, Montserrat. Montserrat. Um, so my question was along that, um, along the same idea. I guess I want to know beside, beside this innovation fellowship, do you guys offer, uh, besides the uh, research protected time, some classes for uh, the residents how to patent uh, an idea, how to pitch an idea, how to start your own protocol, your technique, your technology. I guess that's my question. You know, you're getting at something that we've thought about. So um, um, I, I don't say we, we would, there aren't like formal courses that are set up, but I do, there are lectures, you know, about these things. Eric Luthard is one of those, but others in, in our department also are very active. Gavin Dunn has a startup 
uh, a, a company that's a um, that's co 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 run by, uh, by with, with Eric um, and others. So there are lectures and things. What we're trying to do though is also we have a our old residency coordinator Sophie Church is now uh, the a research coordinator. So she kind of moved to a different job within the department. And she's supporting research and in particular is supporting uh, a lot of what you just kind of talked about. Um, so, and it's a way to kind of build in infrastructure and know-how about how to do this, some of these things. And I think that as she gets further into that position, she will be a great resource along with the faculty about uh, uh, how to do some of these things. So, it, so it's kind of built into it, but it, there's no formal coursework that, that, that is, that, that's there for this. Can I make a couple comments about that, Greg? Yeah, please. Um, so there's actually a lot of resources um, uh, available uh, to residents or um, anyone in in interested in entrepreneurship and uh, uh, technology development, <clears throat> both at the university level and with uh, uh, partner institutions that we have um, in a sort of a neighborhood of St. Louis called the Cortex, which is adjacent to our medical campus. Um, and there are actually several uh, biogenerators there that work very closely with the university. Uh, they offer coursework, um, uh, both the School of Engineering uh, and the Olin School of Business um, uh, in conjunction with the uh, ICTS at, at WashU actually have several courses related to uh, developing technology, uh, patenting things, uh, uh, creating a startup um, and, and doing your own entrepreneurship. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, we have another uh, technology development program here uh, called the LEAP program uh, in which you go through um, taking your idea and, and basically pitching it uh, to a panel of uh, people from uh, industry. Um, and if you uh, win the competition, um, they'll give you um, uh, quite a bit of money to develop your idea with. Um, so um, I, I would say there, there actually are a lot of resources and um, you kind of have to know what they are. Um, Eric um, Luthard actually does have a few uh, stock lectures on this that he'll periodically give to the uh, residents and he does it through his you know, Center for Innovation and, and Neurotechnology uh, programs as well. So um, I guess the short answer is yes, I actually have found myself that there's a lot of resources here um, and a lot of partnership with, uh, with, uh, with kind of a biogenerator startups uh, and it's nice because all these uh, programs are uh, right next to our medical campus in uh, St. Louis, so. Thank you. It's um, basically because one of the main problems that I have faced as an early basic researcher is, is how to move forward the ideas from the laboratory to the clinic. So that's something that I am really looking forward to find uh, in a residency program. So thank you. Dr. Osmond knows more about it than me because he actually is another who, who has uh, uh, taken advantage of this uh, environment and uh, uh, has uh, developed some really innovative catheter uh, technology that, that uh, he's looking, uh, I mean, uh, obviously for a patent and, and uh, from that perspective, but also looking for um, NIH funding to help support the next uh, 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 step in that development. So he, he, he's very involved as well. Are there other questions we can answer? All right. Well, it was great meeting you all. Uh, I hope you have a, a great rest of your Sunday and weekend. And thanks so much for taking the time to get to know us a little bit better. Uh, I, I do think that uh, there is, uh, you know, there's ebbs and flows, there's ups and downs and, uh, you know, in, in, in programs, uh, you know, and uh, they tend to kind of go around a certain mean. Uh, and I think, you know, we are clearly one of the, uh, you know, uh, best in academic neurosurgical programs, I think, historically. Uh, preparing the next generation and doing great research and, and leading uh, uh, technology and, and, and clinical medicine. Uh, but I do think that we are on an upswing and, uh, and I, think there, I, I think it's an exciting dynamic time uh, with uh, new faculty and uh, uh, new programs, uh, uh, new you know, infrastructure and spaces like the Brain Tumor Center and the Neuroscience Research Building and the new administrative offices. It's just a really exciting time. So I hope you, you know, consider our program seriously as you go about this process. Thanks everybody, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Dr. Zippel. Thank you. Sure. Hey Ralph, Harrison's plus one after 17.